Hello, and welcome to a new Single Scoop episode. I'm JR, and today I'm joined by Oldar. Hi. And a special guest, our friend, the Idol Class. Hi, thanks for having me on. It's going to be interesting because I've listened to so many episodes that, you know, hopefully I don't forget and just listen instead of talk. <laughs> but yes, I'm the Idol Cast. I've got a podcast called The Idol Cast. I do episodes on history, music, just sort of all sorts of stuff, it's sort of a passion project. Well, we're very happy to have you on. Thank you. But yeah, today we're going to be discussing an article that came out a little while ago, and it was in the Korea Times. It was called K-pop, Full of Aesthetic but Devoid of Art by David A. Tizard. So, Oldar, why don't you give us a little explanation of what was the meat and bones of this article? So, it was an opinion piece, so not just a general facts kind of thing, just an opinion piece about the state of K-pop and how music nowadays is bland and repetitive. He also makes an argument about music numbers and capitalism, but doesn't expand on it so much as stick with his main thesis on how K-pop music nowadays is bad. For some background on Dr. Tizard, according to the article, he, and I'm quoting directly because otherwise I would just be copying his words, quote, has a PhD in Korean studies and lectures at Seoul Women's University and Hanyang University. He is a social slash cultural commentator and musician who has lived in Korea for nearly two decades. He is also the host of the Korea Deconstructed podcast. Unquote. I looked at his podcast and he covers a variety of topics relating to Korea, but he doesn't really dive into K-pop very often. He has a lot of guests who appear on the show to talk about the topic that's being featured, but generally... Not K-pop, it's more about Korean life. And as of right now, I do not know the extent of how knowledgeable he is about K-pop history or what K-pop music that he likes, if he does, which actually would have been useful in discussing this article, but oh well. But now that we've given the background of today's discussion, we're just going to get into it. So Idolcast, why don't you go first? Because you actually studied music, so I think that your understanding of music gives you a different color than what JR and I have. Yeah, well, I thought this was kind of an interesting article or opinion piece. I'm glad you sent it to me because I really kind of enjoyed sort of reading it and picking it apart because I think he kind of hits on a few things that you see in a lot of cultural criticism about pop music sort of generally, but also from these sort of K-pop pieces by people who have no background really in K-pop, but maybe are coming from a Korean studies background. And, it, you know, it is pop music. So, I mean, he kind of starts off lumping all of art into one big bucket and then sort of blanketly saying, old stuff is good, new stuff is bad. And, you know, he doesn't really go all that deep into it sort of expects us to kind of follow along. But I think he misses out on a lot of nuance that really kind of leads you to believe that his opinion in his opinion piece is kind of reactionary. <laughs> because, you know, what what is art? I mean, he doesn't really explain it. Yeah, there's no definition anywhere in the article. And you're just kind of left thinking like, okay, but you have no basis for what you're talking about. At least you're not telling us what your basis is. It feels like he was sort of giving an overview of his opinion, but I didn't feel like he would go into expanding his opinion on anything. Such as like when he's talking about the numbers and how a lot of it is just like being sort of hyped up. Like you also have like with CD sales that people are buying multiple copies just to get a photo card and then they'll dump them later. This is a known issue. I really wish he had gone into that or explain why that behavior has come around because that didn't used to be a thing. It would have been interesting for him to explain not just how the industry has changed and how it makes money and how their strategy has changed, but also how does does that affect fan behavior? Like, how does that affect numbers and the perception of what is popular? And how is he judging what is popular, too? Because he says at one point that idols are better known. And, you know, it, I mean, he kind of implies like they're popular because they're pushed by the media and people just consume it. But in my experience, 
that's really not true. I mean, idols are kind of a niche market in Korea. You know, in my overview and just sort of looking at Korean news articles, I think you are more likely to see trot artists or, you know, coverage of of hip hop artists or even more sort of mainstream singers like IU than you are to hear like, you know, Kepler or any of the new, you know, treasure. Right. Right. Or even older artists too, because I've noticed this that like I do understand that there's so much news going on to where you have to pick and choose. But I've noticed with a lot of English articles, they only talk about first gen artists if either there's some big tie in with something that's popular or something bad happened to them. (laughs) or they're getting married. But you will never hear about new music releases from someone like Kankta. The amount of times, I especially watched this last, I believe it was last year when he was doing his year round releases, where I saw less articles on that, even though there were several times where they would look at the news SM released before him, and then the post after him, and they would just completely blow him off. Like there were certain things like that. I'm like, I like, I understand you have to cherry pick because there's so much out there. But when you were consistently cherry picking against certain artists, that's when I have a problem. Or there was a singer who hadn't been around for a number of years. He suddenly made a release. And I don't know if it's his last one. If I remember correctly, he's either middle age or more elderly. And no word of it on international news. It was only through a Korean article that I heard about it. And then I listen to the song and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. We miss out on a lot. I think this is where, you know, Dr. Tizard really is, you know, correct in his piece because I, I think a lot of the international coverage of K-pop is pretty terrible. <laughs> it, oh, it, yeah. You know, it does focus on numbers and it does right. focus on kind of the sort of what's happening right now and it does only focus on Mm k-pop idols but you know if he meant international k-pop coverage he should have said so he also talks about just like this is a direct quote the musicians who get the most coverage and have their names plastered all over our media are not the most talented unquote and i think that that's just kind of disingenuous he literally picked two big groups bts and blackpink and then threw out all the rest didn't mention anyone else and i don't know if anyone else has noticed this but whenever articles like this come out they never mention say 17 one of the biggest boy groups out there who since debut has constantly been praised for how much work they put into their art how they actually have a hand in making their art much more than a lot of k-pop artists and the only reason that they're not mentioned is because they don't fit the narrative and (laughs) it's just it's really frustrating because Seventeen isn't the only group like that. IU, you mentioned IU a bit earlier. She has surpassed multiple groups and other solo artists in terms of sales in certain categories. She has the most perfect all kills out of everyone still to this day. BTS has not even caught up to her in terms of perfect all kills. And she writes her own music. She has a hand in her music video production. Like, It just, it bothers me so much that these people are like, well, BTS and Blackpink are the biggest ones, so we're only going to focus on them and bash the entire industry with, while only looking at them, even though there are other big people who have done great things. Well, also with BTS, I very much felt like he only focused on them Mm -hmm. after they started releasing music in English. I don't know how much he knows of their backlog. Like, does he know about the Wings album? Does he know about their debut stuff? I would like to know if he did, because then that would also change my opinion of this piece. I had more questions than criticisms of it. I more was like, what don't you know? I'm not sure. To be honest, I think even if he did listen to Wings, I mean, in my opinion, I think the most beautiful moment in life, part one and two are BTS's best work. Both, you know, taken together, I think, or if not one of the best sort of K-pop albums to come out, but... Uh, you know, I just think he doesn't like pop music, which is fine. You know, you don't, nobody is telling you you have to like pop music, but you know, that's the music that people listen to. I mean, people listen to pop music. If you only want to listen to jazz, you know, he uses Ella Fitzgerald as an example, then listen to jazz. Going back, Ella Fitzgerald at the time was kind of, you know, adult contemporary kind of (laughs) popular music. (laughs) It's just like she sang standards, which were the popular music of the Tin Pan Alley days. She did, you know, a wonderful cover of Tisket and Tasket. 
green and yellow basket fantastic cover she didn't write that song does that mean that it's a bad performance no i mean i just think he's just using criteria that i don't think are very helpful in judging music and in judging art it's almost like he has a fundamental misunderstanding of what pop music is because he's trying to put so much onto it we're sitting here like we know that it's not that deep at times. I'm not quite sure what he's trying to get at. Yeah, I mean, if he wants to judge chord changes, you know, K-pop is not the venue for that. <laughs> like, <laughs> if it, And he's also not taking it as a complete picture, too. I mean, you do have the art production, you have concepts. I mean, K-pop is not just the song, it's also the choreography. It's also the the performances. It's also the styling and the costumes and yeah, the art design. And these things are important in K-pop. And if you can't accept that K-pop is sort of a whole, you know, 360 thing, it's not just sort of these songs in isolation. I don't think you can judge it effectively. Right. I agree. I was just thinking about, I'm trying to find it because I know I copied and pasted in my notes, but he was talking about the music and he's like, so quote from his article, if you have not watched every vlog, buy all 28 remixes of Butter. Somebody got to tell him about Old Town Road. <laughs> purchased Purple Happy Meals on four continents and spent more than five years of your life streaming their music videos. You simply don't get it. All these disparate products complement and explain each other. The true meaning is missed as soon as we try to understand any single part of it by itself. And so something that I thought about it was, well, with BTS, they reference their own past works and in-jokes frequently. They self-reference all the time, but not all groups do it. But BTS, this is a big thing with them. So when fans say, oh, you didn't get the joke about BT21 that was included in the music video, that's what they're talking about. Or with the Love Yourself promotions, if you missed on that, when they reference it later, like that's a callback to it. There's so much context. It's not just we were given a song and we're just doing a music video and that's it. Right. Like, BTS is not one of those groups at this point. That's a really good point. And I do think you're right that BTS is a bad example for him to pick because they do reference themselves a lot. And to a large extent, they are sort of targeting their fans and not kind of more general listeners. And, you know, right. some groups can just sort of do a song and maybe throw in a reference for fans and it doesn't matter. But I think you're right that BTS does focus a lot on this. And it's one mm -hmm. of the things their fans love about them, which is great, you know. Yeah, and also I feel like Blackpink also self-reference a lot. Like, there's a lot of things with Blackpink that when they do release, they've repeated something over and over. And we haven't really seen, like, I remember when they first debuted, they were kind of changing up. They had a general through line of their aesthetic and styling. But the similarity that we've seen since, where it's like, it's kind of the same thing, but they changed it up with this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like that there is some difference. Yeah. I'm also kind of big into history. And the thing that got me was that this guy, he said he's been in for Korea for about 20 years, which would mean he would have arrived in Korea during 1.5 gen, which was basically the wild west of K-pop. <laughs> like that was when previous strategies and formulas for idol groups failed across the board from like the biggest companies. And so then everyone had to pivot and first gen idols that left their groups, they were struggling to find their way to make like their own different sounds and fans were not appreciative of it. Like, if you today talk to certain HOT fans about Mooney June's Legend album, they will get angry. Still. It's like, he would have been around during that time. Now, I don't know, was he interested in K-pop before he came to Korea? How much he was aware of it when he was there? But with the lack of history being included, that kind of bugged me. Where when people talk about, oh, Teddy doesn't write anything good. He just writes bland stuff for Blackpink. It's like, do you not know about his work with One Time or Lexi? <laughs> he is so good at hip-hop. And I think his problem is that he's being stuck with pop because mm -hmm. blackpink is not the hip-hop like one-time hip-hop like we're not, not talking about fly gentlemen here and I think that that also shows a difference. And also, I do know that Teddy does not work alone on Blackpink tracks. Like, Min was showing us, like, there were two other producers who worked with him on one of Blackpink's tracks. And it's like, oh, he's not alone. And just, like, looking for those more little details adds more context. And it's like, oh, this wasn't what I thought it was. And I really would have liked him to include that in his article. But that's, of course, something that is just me. Same with, though, when he's going to, earlier when you're talking about people performing other people's stuff, I was thinking about how, in the 1950s, how many people sang Shaboom? I know, I've got at least four different versions of it. Or how many people sang 
I'll be glad when you're dead, you rascal you from the 1930s, where people, it was like a trend where people would cover the same song or St. James Infirmary. But there's certain nuances that not just in K-pop, but in music history as well. And I really would have liked him to acknowledge that. Like when there's at one point where he says, oh, there is good music out there. Then why aren't you highlighting exactly. it and explaining the contrast? Exactly. I, like give me names. Give me names of idols who are doing good things. He has this entire thing bashing two groups only. He doesn't look at anything else. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, well, there is good music. I'm not being cynical or something like that. I can't remember the exact exact thing he said but he just seems to be coming from a very limited point of view and this is something i've talked about on my podcast but just this idea that the only kind of quote-unquote authentic music is something personal something that you write yourself with your own lyrics referencing your personal life that you i don't know record in your bedroom and then sort of put out on this marketplace that it's completely based on merit. There's nothing else. Everyone is just going to be judging songs strictly <laughs> mm. on musical merit. I mean, this right. doesn't exist. It's never existed. Like, <laughs> this is a fantasy. This world doesn't exist that he's talking about. You know, pop music or the music industry, I mean, it's an industry. It's a business. Even somebody like, you know, Neil Young or Lou Reed or Joni Mitchell, these great singer-songwriters had some sort of, you know, aesthetic choices that they made or some sort of affect that they played into that helped make them larger than life characters and there's nothing wrong with that right. or David Bowie you know these greats and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that I think it adds to the mystique it can add to mm -hmm. your appreciation of the song hey, but he just speaks as if the only thing that we should be judging is like strictly musical merit and that's it well that also made me think like I know that he's talking about music nowadays but then some of his arguments made me think about K-pop music in general and it made me wonder does he know about so G. And does he know about H.O.T.? Like, I think that if he was aware of H.O.T.'s third and fifth album, that might be something that might have changed how he was wording it. Like, he never said compared to K-pop in the past. The thing is, he doesn't even need to go that far back. Like, should he? Sure, yes. But he does not have to go that far back in order to find things that he would maybe deem quote unquote good. There are so many groups that he overlooked in order to take knocks at BTS and Blackpink without going into their histories, without going into the intention behind the group, without even really going into their music. The only time he dives deeper into BTS is to say like you have to watch their vlogs and you have to listen to all 28 mixes of butter and you have to get their BTS meal in order to like appreciate them and it's like you don't though and we know that how come you don't know that <laughs> it feels so reductive all of it right but then he also makes me think of okay there's one part of his article where he says quote there's a lot of creative people out there capable of beautiful things however if we continue to wrap them up in corporate packaging and design them according to the whims of teenagers we will miss the opportunity to move hearts and minds to upset people to challenge ideas to confront stereotypes to break traditions and to upset the status quo rather than so Simply reinforce it, unquote. And that's where I thought of Sote Jean HOT, where there was a pop industry in the 80s. I don't I'm not sure how much he's aware of that. In Korea, it was going on like Sobang Cha. But then Sote G was the one where when he came out with I know, well Sote G and boys, but he ruled Sote G and boys, where the youth were paying attention to him. Mm -hmm. Like it was songs for them that he understood them and that was part of a trend of looking at teenagers, not just pushing stuff in teenagers face, but making music for them and were like come back home like how much that was affecting and then because of that focus on teenagers then you have a group like hot who they originally started by advertising to teenagers but by the time their third album was around they were directly talking to korea as a whole they were directly being involved in issues like the imf crisis when they went on a u.s tour and donated usd from their tour to the korean unemployment fund because they wanted to get their country out of debt and how much they were criticized politicians they told people who their careless actions ended up killing children in their lyrics they would say quote from the rooftop i might snipe ya unquote or like if you consider outside castle where they were directly criticizing korea's treatment of people with disabilities and at the end they included sign language in their choreography and which was done by he jun he wrote the lyrics he composed it he put the choreography together and that was also the title track that was the only one of their title tracks that was not written by yu young jean who was basically their mentor the whole time and then also the album cover had braille on it. 
how mm-hmm. serious H.O.T. was about social issues. But a lot of that, oh, when you debut, you're going to talk about social stuff, fell out of popularity because people were getting their promotions cut short or consider Baby Vox's debut song to men, Democracy, where they were very much ridiculed for that. And then they came back with Haircut and people were still like, oh, and then they dropped it. And the next album, they immediately start off, yeah, yeah, yeah. But knowing that history of, yes, there is social critique, but there were people who went over the top and did it. And what were the reactions? That's something really important to know why that was given up because it was not financially feasible or Xinhua. They debuted with a social critique, but they're not known for that. That's not what their songs are known for. They're more known for how long they've been a group and their performances Mm -hmm. and how good they're good at singing and dancing. If the problem is that he doesn't think that contemporary pop music is good or that he doesn't like the way that songs are made with the bit of these loops and the top line singer on top of it or, or the hip hop elements, if he doesn't like that, I think that's completely valid. Oh, for sure. But then he can't just put a blanket thing and say that it's all bad, it's all terrible, because he doesn't have the ear or the sense to distinguish between good (laughs) and bad because he thinks it's all bad. Right. And if he went through and looked at, like, there are idols who they do who do ballads, you know, Mm -hmm. Shiny's Own You did, like, a lovely ballad album. Winners Kang Sung Yoon did a really nice sort of rock-based album. You know, they're out there if you want to listen to them, but yeah, do you have to sort of seek it out because the main style of music right now is this contemporary pop. I think he is just on some very thin ice when he says, it's all bad, it's all bad. Mm -hmm. You know, Ella Fitzgerald is good. Well, sorry, but that style of jazz music, that's not what everyone wants to listen to. And if you do want to listen to it, it's there on Spotify or wherever, but that's just not what people want to hear. So I don't know what he wants us all to do. Just erase sort of the last century of music. Like I think that just his entire premise is just very, very reactionary. And I mean, if he wants to listen to jazz, he could listen to IU's Modern Times. Like that entire album is influenced heavily by jazz. Again, it's just him being very narrow-minded in what he sees as K-pop and what he sees as good K-pop. Well, he doesn't even say what's good K-pop either. Exactly. When he says that there are people who are bringing good stuff, I would have loved him to name names. Mm-hmm. Like, Kongta last year was like, I'm going in the jazz way. And we were like, fascinating, Kongta, go for it. And it was received positively among H.O.T. fans, and Kongta is primarily known for just ballads, and sometimes he does pop stuff. But generally, since he's gone solo, he just does ballads. So I really would have liked him to weigh in on that. Or like Hyunjin Young. Dude started off with hip-hop. That was what he was known for. And then as he's older, he does jazz. I really would have liked that kind of nuance where especially Kongta is still considered an idol. Mm-hmm. He is still an active idol where like he does the concerts. He's got the fan stuff. He doesn't have an official light stick, which is a problem with SM concerts. But he still is very much in that vein. So it's like we can point to him and go, he's still an idol and he's doing all this stuff. And he still does the pop stuff with HOT. Whenever they get together, why aren't you looking at him? There's a... a- this is, he's a Japanese idol, but Domoto Tsuyoshi from Kinky Kids has an entire side career as just like he's got this funk band and they just play funk music and put out funk CDs. That's so fun. That's awesome. And like that's... Yeah, I mean, he's in his 40s now. He's been an idol for like 25 years. He has this band where they play funk. Like, it's good. It's good funk. Not every idol is also a musician, and I think that's okay. Not every Mm. idol is primarily a singer, and I think that's okay, too. But I don't think you can paint the entire industry with this broad brush that I swear I... He just sort of seems to have pulled from international media coverage of Mm -hmm. K-pop, which I agree is terrible and metrics focused. Right. Which I understand why it's done besides of, of course, getting revenue in place of like, well, very few people buy newspapers to a point where it's feasible to for the printing of it and everything. But Fortune fans are especially obsessed with it because it's a quantifiable metric of popularity. It's like, well, how popular was your favorite? It's no longer like good enough to say there's a lot of people who remember and sing along with it. Mm-hmm. Like it makes me think of QOQ's Donagara, how if you ask someone who was in Korea in the mid 2000s, they're like, they remember that fondly, but it was basically a ripoff of Afro Man's Because I Got High. <laughs> 
But having saying my artist sold a million albums, I think that that's something that's like, okay, it shows something. But then when you look into it, it's like, oh, people are buying multiple and then they were dumping it. I feel like that should count against it personally because yes it was sold Mm -hmm. but it wasn't consumed in the way like when hot sold over a million copies of their first album it was because people around the country were like dang i need a copy of this and they weren't buying multiples now there were two versions but that was more of a reprinting and i know i had the first printing when i did have an hot cd and also when i had the second cd i had the original version not the edited one i know that but like the bulk stuff and the streaming stuff wasn't really a thing back then so so comparing especially the metrics of past sales to now, it's apples to oranges in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I think there's also the K-pop coming to the West. Like it's a long time coming, but it mm-hmm. has not hit with such force as it has in recent years. Right. And I think a lot of K-pop fans have just taken such pride in the fact that it finally has hit the West in the way that it has. And so right. they're like, look at us, we finally made it. I think there's definitely that aspect to it as well, which I understand, right. you know, like this is a long time coming. Yeah. But then there's also the problem, though, where because it is suddenly so big in their memory that they think that it's the first time. Right. That K-pop has been in the West. Like the idol cast sent me an article about Hyun Jun Young, I believe in 1993, that was printed in the LA Times about him being in LA to film his music video. And I was interacting with the community and there's a whole thing. We'll go into another time about it because it's fascinating. But then also consider H.O.T. did US tours. Jackie's, same thing. Or like Rain on the Stephen Colbert show. Mm-hmm. Like there's been many steps, but because of how big it is, people think that it never happened with first gen especially it was like not only did it happen before in first gen but several people did it before in first gen right because you didn't see it and you don't remember it and you don't know the groups of the past you don't know that this is nothing new it's just new to you that with like groups like bts where they're coming back 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 to where and getting into published stuff that's outside of just k-pop press then it's in their forefront of their mind and then they're retaining oh we know this group like, it's not just a Q Sakamoto with Ueo Muite Aruko, where it was just like a novelty thing. Like, it's people are keeping track of it, which is good, but it's not new. Right. It's just new to English language media, which <laughs> I think is a, the, a problem I've reeled against on my podcast right. many times. Yeah. Because, yeah, it's this idea that sort of the limit of what can be known is what is already known in English. Right in sort of other articles it kind of just gets repeated Mm -hmm. and repeated and repeated which is why you have the narrative in sort of these mainstream articles in like time magazine or rolling stone or whatever where you jump right from saltagian boys like nothing happened bts and it's kind of like "Mm, i think there were some i think we missed a few steps in there especially with donbon shinki like they were in the Guinness Book of World Records, but yeah, there's certain yeah. things like that that I would really like for people to recognize. But then that's also been a huge thing in the first generation community where more and more first gen fans are turning into curators. We are seeing a huge rise in that with the community because we are tired of this narrative that's going on. There's a lot that's available now that maybe wasn't available online a few years ago. I just did an episode on kind of the rise on, of the hip hop idol kind of focused on like block b as mm. i guess sort mm. of a focal point but cho pd oh yeah <laughs> kind of the <laughs> so, oh yeah cho, he's yeah, a thing but, but, <laughs> but i i found references to him and his first you know breakthrough hits in an archive of billboard magazine that's up on i think it's in like some sort of google books archive but found references to cho pd from like 2000 so you know korean pop and korean pop music was known in not just the metrics way but in a real way that he was sort of being lauded as this like forerunner of digital music i mean billboard magazine in 2000 and now that's all just been erased so i think the loss for a time of that knowledge is also what's contributing to this misunderstanding Mm -hmm. and i don't think we realized how far it was until recently now it's like oh shoot and then it's like (laughs) trying to get back and you also see everyone wants to be an anthropologist and just do like surface level Mm -hmm. because they don't want to go into history (laughs) too much work well and doesn't this sort of not to bring it right back around to dr tizzard but you know the fact that all he can name is bts and blackpink doesn't that just speak to how little press 
for idols there really is if this is all that he's heard about and he's been in Korea for 20 years? I think the reason why he's going after those two groups is that those are the ones that I assume he sees most frequently show up in Western media, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're the most in demand. They're just the ones driving the clicks. But once again, like with Blackpink, people don't look at them for their music. <laughs> like I think they're more <laughs> for like their style, their influence. Like to an extent that is very YG, but with YG, when I think of traditional historical YG, it's kind of expected that you have like your own musical style, you grow. Like that's what YG used to be big for back in the day. That at some point it was going to come from the artists and how much he worked them. Like how long did GD have to do stuff? Mm -hmm. Like how long was it or what was it? It was like he had to write one song a week or a day or something like that. There was a lot of absurd bars that he had to jump. Like there was a lot of that. That's what I think of a traditional YG that I've not seen in his latest girl group. But I think that still happens with the boy groups. But there's always been a disparity between girl groups and boy groups in YG, to be fair, historically going back. Yeah. Yeah. And with YG too, I mean, T.O.P. just had some really big coverage in sort of the art press. So I mean, <laughs> the fine arts press, you know, if you're talking about sort of prestigious coverage and prestigious sort of art, I mean, I think that should count for something. But yeah, well, with Blackpink too, I think their forte as idols is not music, but their image. And you're right, they're very in demand and well known for being influencers for just their style and their look. And was it Lisa was just at Paris Fashion Week? And yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I don't think it's fair to judge them primarily as mm. musicians against just singers like Ella Fitzgerald. Like, it, it <laughs> yeah, really is exactly. just apples and oranges. Like, <laughs> that's one of my big things about this article is that he'll say that no K pop fan wants to listen to rational analysis. And he does say that in regard to like musical composition and stuff like that. But his own analysis is kind of terrible when you break it down. He doesn't <laughs> analyze anything, he just makes very surface level points. Would you you call it a hot take? <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> I think you're right about that. <laughs> um, it is an opinion, but I feel like right, like he'll skim over things, but not go into them and explore why. Like, why is Blackpink different from Twenty One? He doesn't know who Twenty One is. I can guarantee that. <laughs> But that's my other point, because he only knows BTS and Blackpink, as far as we know, what leg does he have to stand on in this article? He gives no credibility for being someone to give this opinion. And you don't need to have like anything backing you to have an opinion, but it helps. I struggle with this article overall because I feel like he doesn't really make any good points. Not he doesn't make any good points. He makes a handful of good points, but they're overshadowed by all his bad points. <laughs> And Idolcast, she also did article reacting to this article. The first point that I liked, though, from it was, quote, And the least discerning audience is who pop music has always aimed at. It's lowest common denominator music, not high art. You can't judge Ring Ding Dong by the same standards that you would for Steve Reich piece. I mean, you can, but it's not Ring Ding Dong that's going to look like a ding dong for doing it, unquote. <laughs> I love that. And... <laughs> My reaction to it was that the target audience isn't the cream of the musical crop. Like, it's not like the highest music critic. That's not who it's aimed at. It's aimed at literally everyone else who goes, wow, that's funky. I like it. Mm -hmm. And then there was another point you made where you said, quote, now I will say that this point becomes muddled when K-pop stands put forward their favorite idols new music as a masterpiece to end all masterpieces performed by the greatest musicians of their generation. And when the educated listener tunes in and they hear this, they're likely to give a very unimpressed reaction. Unquote. And that also kind of reminded me that a lot of the people who are making these statements and reacting that way are kids and teenagers who either haven't heard or don't yet have an interest in the most mind bending, challenging music and art. They just want something to cover up the silence in their rooms when they're studying or to tune out people who are shouting. Mm -hmm. And I was also thinking about how a pop song that says, baby, you are just, just right, spoken by attractive and smiley guys might be more relevant to them in that moment than sitting to appreciate the musicality of the song itself. Right. Where it's like, it means something different to them. It's a universal, I don't know, is phenomenon is the word to say, but putting 
teenagers down for things that they like has been happening for years centuries probably yeah and it's just like does anyone remember the beatles can someone take five minutes and just do some research on the beatles and the fact that beatlemania was largely pushed by young female fans he does not put a gender on the teenagers when he does say the whims of teenagers but it's very nice it's nice but it is fairly well known that a lot of k-pop fans are young girls yeah (laughs) and to be constantly putting them down is ridiculous and also just unfair i think also i do want to say that none of us are teenagers correct oh no no. (laughs) i'm i'm way past just wanted to make sure yeah (laughs) there's just large parts of k-pop that are also enjoyed by adults ranging all the way into their like twilight years even it drives me crazy (laughs) There was a quote in the HRT book in Kongta section. Kongta is very mouthy in there, which I appreciate. But he was talking about how he got a letter from a woman. I believe she was about middle-aged. And she said that she had his picture in her study Bible when she was at church. And then <laughs> he said that it wasn't until college that he knew how many adults actually liked HOT music. He was so surprised that people like just would come up to him and be like, hey, I like that new thing you released. I think that we have a stereotype of it or like I remember Mooney Jun said that he remembered Kim Jae-jung because he's like, you're one of the few males in the audience. And of course, Jae-jung was a super H.O.T. fan. Mm-hmm. People have screenshotted posts that he made as a teenager defending H.O.T. and just railing against other groups. And it's hilarious. <laughs> but just to know like it's those kind of people do stick out. Mm hmm. And there's nothing wrong with being a teenager and thinking that your favorite artist is the best that ever existed, that they invented the concept of music. I mean, I think that's pretty normal. Um, You know, I was listening to an episode of the, I think it was the Joe Budden podcast, or one of his guests, I forget now the context, but the point was that whoever was speaking never really liked Bruno Mars, thought that what he was doing was kind of hacky, sort of a copy of what other artists had done in the past. And it wasn't until he realized that the teens listening to it and young people people listening to it and kind of hearing this stuff for the first time didn't know those older artists Mm, so they had nothing to compare it to so for them this was just like the greatest thing ever and once he made that connection it was like oh okay why would i argue with someone who thinks bruno mars is the best because there's no point to it just let them think that and if they want to get into the older stuff they can you know and five ten years when they vary their playlists or whatever but you know that's who you're talking to is someone that's never heard this other stuff so they think that what they know is the best because that's all they know and you you can tell someone to you know educate yourself or like listen to more stuff but you can't chide someone to (laughs) to, like having good days like just let young people listen to what they want to listen to you know it's fine But even then, it's like the people that Bruno Mars is like referential of, those people took reference from people before them and those people before them. So it's like... Of course, it builds. Everything's a remix. I don't know if you guys have seen that video. It's essentially just like, Mm. look at this song that quote unquote remixed this song and it just keeps on going back and back and back. And it's like, this is nothing right. new. And yet every few years, people put out articles like this acting like it is. It boggles my mind. <laughs> it also reminds me of, I know JR, I don't know if you, Idolcast, listen to them as well. The one thing I remember about Glee, besides it being awful, <laughs> was how the music they would feature, especially when it was older, they would talk about the artist who originally sang it. Mm. And of course, they would do these covers. But that was how I got into like 70s and 80s music was from that show, mm. where then I would go back and listen to this music, it kind of caught me up on music history. Because from the time I was about 13 until early 20s, I was only listening to second gen and beginning third gen and a little bit of first gen Mm K-pop. So that really helped me with like, oh, look at all this great music I'm missing out on. And then eventually that led me getting into 60s, 50s, 
40s, 30s, 20s. And now I'm sort of trying to go back to the late 1800s and listen to music from there. Like what was popular music back then? There's a lot of things that we miss out on, which is when you have that, it's like, oh, there's someone before. But of course, that artist who did the version that you know will mean a lot to you. But the problem I personally run into with that is when they say, oh, this is the first and no one's done this before. It doesn't exist. Or there's also a lot of people who will go on music videos for first gen and say, oh, the new cover's better. Mm -hmm. And just like dismiss the artist. And they'll literally seek out the original that's still being consumed by fans of that older person. And they'll just act very rude that way and it's like can you not (laughs) yeah that's really disrespectful i mean i guess it just speaks to kind of the teen impulse to just trash everything that came before Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know that the lack of respect for elders i mean maybe in 10 years they'll come around or maybe they'll just forget their whole k-pop phase ever happened i wonder how much of that just like feeds into each other like constantly being told that what you listen to Mm -hmm. is garbage and then it's a reactionary thing to be like well what you listen to is garbage like (laughs) i feel like (laughs) people need to just be kinder (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I've tried cutting that down unless, once again, it's a very specific situation where mm-hmm. it's like, H.O.T. was awful. Your version of Hangbook was so boring compared to the Super Junior one that everyone copies. It's yeah. like, yeah, then why is it there have been multiple fourth gen groups who said H.O.T.'s choreography is too hard and they don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a joke running amongst the first gen fandom that Hangbook is the scariest thing to fourth gen. <laughs> Well, I mean, it also speaks to how much technology has changed things, too, Mm -hmm. to be honest. You know, I I think a lot of these fourth gen groups, you know, because they came up during COVID, or at least their formative stuff has been during COVID, they don't have the interaction with the live audience. You know, do they know how to play to a crowd? They can just cut and edit. Do you know how to do a whole choreography one time through? Perfect, you know, for a live camera. And with singing, too, there are so many technical things to help out now that didn't in the past. And, you know, to be fair to Dr. Tizard and, you know, his love of Ella Fitzgerald, who is a fantastic <laughs> singer. Of course. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you to make a decent quality song now, you don't have to be Ella Fitzgerald. <laughs> And, you know, for better or worse, you know, somebody with an average singing voice can get enough technical help through these tools that exist now to put out a decent recording where in the past to get that decent recording, you would either have to be a lot better singer or just run through it time and time and time and time again or have somebody stitch tape together manually, which I've done it. It's not very fun. <laughs> Yeah, it's just one of those things where, like, to be fair to his point, there are things that maybe we did lose that were better in the past. But, I mean, at this point, what are you going to do? Like, you can't take away technical tools that you can just, I don't know, learn to appreciate what this does give us. Well, and Jared and I talked about this a while ago, how the other appeal with getting into the K-pop industry is that it's one of the few jobs that's left that's publicly known where you just have to have something about you. You don't have to be the greatest singer, rapper, dancer. Just go in, give it a shot. And if they'll say, you know what, there's something about you, we can try train you up to be a better singer dancer later Mm -hmm. like it's on the job training and open to young people and there's a possibility to have gains and job experience like there's a lot of jobs nowadays where you have to already have to have all that done and ready to go they don't want to train people anymore they don't want people to learn how to adapt to this particular job's function right so that's another thing that's kind of open that way which i think is kind of fascinating with all the bad stuff with it it does have that one good quality about it. Like I think about HRT's J1 and how he passed his audition was that he went with two friends. They danced in front of director Kim who said, you're awful. And J1 said that he was nerves really got to him because he's a very nervous guy and then he got called back and he performed in front of Lee Suman and nerves got to him again he did badly and Lee Suman went you know what you're not great (laughs) but there's just something about you when you came in the door like I just felt like you had a great presence and you know what we're gonna get you to be a better dancer singer we're gonna get you there just come on in and we'll train you up and sure enough J1 was one of the members known for acrobatics and then when he later went solo he released I think that might be the first ballad he ever did solo Solitude Love and it is very unexpected if you're just thinking of Jaywon the rapper who's always in the background it's like this guy can hold his own so just like give people a chance to grow that yeah they might not be the greatest now but you don't know what they'll grow into mm-hmm. Taman too Shiny's Taman. <laughs> 
Yes, uh, Taman yeah. is a whole other. Yeah. 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 And his development's been just incredible. I mean, the last sort of run of solo albums before he went into the military were just incredible really really incredible and yeah if you think he started <laughs> you know it's a long long journey but i mean he worked really hard and could not be more proud of Taman. or also how many people start off as idols and then they become known as actors and singers mm-hmm. i mean like outside of it mm-hmm. like jang nada my personal opinion she was a great singer but she only does acting now and a lot of people don't know that she was ever an idol or i think of shia junsu and how he is so well known for being in musical theater and how many oh, other idols have mm-hmm. gone into that and there's a huge musical range theater, yeah and that is very unforgiving because you are out on that stage live right and i have a lot of respect for the idols that make that jump to musical right. theater because that's tough and a lot of them come out better for it like i've seen a lot of people compare the members of vix who have done musical theater like before and after and just how much it strengthened their singing abilities yeah it's impressive it really feels like being an idol is a door that can open to other things you might pursue or find that you have another interest in but because it is so open to where if you've got something about you just come on in although it's usually like ten thousand to one (laughs) like your odds are (laughs) awful and then that's even if you get to debut not even counting if your group's going to be successful or your company's got the money to promote you all this yada 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 stuff or if you have an injury that fully just takes you out and you can't be an idol anymore there's been a couple that have happened with but just the open and you might get somewhere else or there's also like Mooney Jun he had the choice because his family was in very bad financial straits when he was a teenager he had a choice between either getting a job in the entertainment industry because he knew some Buddy who was a DJ or go to college. He was like, I have to figure out a way to get my family out of debt. And so these are my two options. And then he went with HOT. And then not only was he able to do that, he was able to get a job and go to college. Sometimes it does open doors that otherwise would have been closed or people would think, oh, I can't do that. But also there is so much that idols go through that I feel like they're like, if I can get through training, I can get through this. <laughs> like it kind of strengthens their resolve and belief in themselves to a certain point. So this is kind of going off. But there was another quote that I was thinking of where it says in his article, quote, it's just our systems of information and control won't let it access the mainstream, unquote. (laughs) Which, first of all, BTS and Blackpink are pretty mainstream, I would consider at this point. And the other thing that I thought of was there's nothing in stopping you from diving into music that's available. Like, do you not know Mm -hmm. how many indie artists push their stuff? Like, there's a certain point to where you're not searching, like, the amount of things that Min finds. Yeah. It's incredible. Just absolutely incredible acts I've never heard of. There was one artist who JR and I were really yeah. obsessed with their song that came out this year called Kill Your Darlings. And we were like, this is awesome. And then there's another person, I think her name is Pure Kim. I don't think I'm pronouncing it right. But she had this one song and it's very interesting how it sounds. And it's like, I don't even know how to explain the music video, but it is very much not what you would be expecting. It's not very normal and it just sticks out in your head. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of stuff like that out there, but you got to go hunting. I feel like mainstream is just, it's right there. But then how stuff becomes mainstream is people looking and it getting brought up. Right. As more and more over time, more and more people get into it. Like Nora Joe is one of those acts where it is very random and weird but their fan base keeps growing just when they appear and do something strange like cider part of his hair was part of a cider bottle they had done up with it or the time that he appeared as a picnic table for bang and like there's certain things like that that go on and then they interact with idols and then more people get to know they're like this is really weird and then they're just fascinated there is stuff like that out there but it is true that they are not covered as much well what mainstream is he talking Mm -hmm. about too I mean, yes, there's exactly. a lot involved here. I mean, is he talking about mainstream Koreans? Is he talking about mainstream America, mainstream in Japan, mainstream in China, mainstream in, you know, Indonesia or, or Australia? TikTok. I mean, there's, yeah. Is he talking about TikTok mainstream or YouTube? It's just the media market is so dispersed. And it this really, to me, this yeah. whole article just read like he was tired of seeing BTS mm-hmm. and Blackpink being kind of lauded for their record sales and being called sort of the best that Korea has to offer in Mm. mainstream English coverage, which completely fair, but just say that. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I felt like he could have gone about it in a way that was less kids these days in their music mm-hmm. sounding. Yes. Like it, yeah. there were parts of it that reminded me. I don't watch South Park very much, but there's this one clip where Randy is trying to listen to the music the kids are listening to, and it just sounds horrible to him. <laughs> and he's trying to pretend like he likes it. Just like that whole <laughs> sort of scene really reminded me of this article when I was reading it. He's like, I don't understand what the kids are listening to nowadays. Mm-hmm. And also kids sometimes just listen to bad stuff. I mean, what you know what? Yeah. I, when I was a kid, I thought like Ice Ice Baby was really cool. Like, is it? <laughs> <laughs> you, be, you be the judge. But, I do remember you know, that. <laughs> yeah, or like, I think he also had like a Ninja Turtle rap. Oh gosh. <laughs> Vanilla Ice. Wasn't he on like the Ninja Turtles theme song? That is so I mean, funny. in my world, oh, that was like, I don't remember. they were like super cool. Right? Mm-hmm. Any adult listening to that was like <laughs> plugging their ears. Uh, but that, you know, that's fine. Yeah. Like, just, yeah. Like, just don't listen to kids' music. I think we also have to acknowledge the shift in narrative that has taken place with BTS specifically. Because when they started blowing up, it was the most beautiful moment in life era. And people were losing their minds over how great their music was. And how well thought out it was. And they had quite a few social critiques in there. They also had love songs. They were a well-rounded group. They were funny. I think that was one of the big reasons that people latched on to them. They were so well-rounded. And as they gained momentum and started pushing forward, I think the narrative started to shift a little. And they were no longer this up-and-coming group. Now they're the juggernauts that they are. And so they no longer have the that appeal that they did when they first started to dip their toes into this quote-unquote mainstream that he's talking about. And that is partially because their music changed a bit. They stopped writing their title tracks, as far as I know. To me, it seems like he would very much be the type of person where it's like, oh my goodness, this person, they're getting into the mainstream, that's great. And then two years later, oh, they're in the mainstream, that's terrible. (laughs) You know? The mainstream does not, the way he's acting like it dictates everything, just feels a little bit disingenuous to me. Because the stuff that's in the mainstream is popular for a reason, right? I don't know. I think the way that people talked about BTS back in 2015 and the way they talk about them now has changed so much. And people were happy at the beginning and now they're like, ugh, BTS. (laughs) They're not the same group they were in 2015. Right. Which, you know, no act is the same. For Dr. Tizard, I do think you're right that he probably is one of those, oh, I like them before they were famous. But I really just think that he misunderstands. He seems to think that what's in the mainstream is popular because it's getting pushed. Mm-hmm. What's the quote about the AI algorithms or whatever? Like, it's just yeah. sort of throwing this stuff to us and we're just consuming it like hogs. But there is something there. Right, you know, yeah. Because there are songs that are pushed, whether it's by sort of fan streaming or whether it's sort of heavy media blitzes. But if something's not genuinely liked, then it just sort of sinks and you never hear from it again. And right. for better or for worse, Dynamite and Butter have been pretty steady, whether it's just somebody's 12-year-old keeping it on the Spotify playlist, like I listen to Ice Ice Baby, I mean, (laughs) it's still somebody finds something appealing about it. And I don't think that if it was just the AI algorithm that you would see that. There's certain groups I've seen on YouTube that are advertising and it's like, I know the name of you, but I have no interest in checking out your music video. (laughs) You can advertise all you like. I don't care. But yeah, it does depend on what's being pushed. And also, I don't think there's a lot of people who know just how long Bong PD was in the entertainment industry doing stuff before he started Big Hit, Mm -hmm. let alone the early history of Big Hit. I think that also might change their perception of BTS. There's a lot of misconceptions. It's a very exaggerated underdog narrative that I don't know where it came from. And there's also just a strain of anti-K-pop sentiment that runs through some of the coverage. Oh, yeah. Which I find kind of distasteful. There was that recent article in The New Yorker, which I was like, hmm, I don't know about this. (laughs) The author, I think, again, just didn't really do any looking at K-pop history. She included some insensitive references to, oh. to Chinese Jonghyun. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, but, okay. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. But also it was just a lot of sort of either implying that BTS invented the concept of things like light sticks. Um, oh my gosh. But, but, <laughs> and fan chants. You Seven know, fans would disagree with you. Ridiculous. <laughs> you know? But, <laughs> but it's this kind of stuff like that where it's not the fault of the group. 
or their fans really but it's just one of those things where it does get kind of frustrating Mm. you know the other thing that i think that i hold people differently with is that when i hear you have a phd when i hear that you've spent so long in korea when i hear you have accolades that you are a journalist investigative journalist or you are an anthropologist Mm. and you were coming up with some wild stuff i really do hold that higher than someone like jr who is a casual fan who does not have a bachelor's a master's a doctorate who to my knowledge (laughs) did not study music like in depth (laughs) like i can read sheet music no problem like I do play instruments, stuff like that. But like, there's certain things that people talk about when they're reviewing music, like Anthony Fantano. There's certain things that he says where it's like, I don't understand that. But if you showed me the sheet music, I would kind of get what you're saying. Like one of the best things that I got in Korea that I wanted for years was sheet music for k-pop songs like an actual printed in a book so i got one that was like a lot of big bts songs and i was so excited because it's like good then i can understand it differently than just listening to it Mm. with the instrumental and their voices like getting under the hood as it were i don't do that for every song because i don't care to learn that for every song one of the interesting reaction channels for that is the i think it's a classical musicians react have you watched that one Mm -hmm. I tend to avoid React channels. Yeah, I I don't watch any Reactors except for the classical musicians React (laughs) because they do get under the hood. And if one of the Reactors is by a piano, they may play out some of the chord changes they hear. Mm. And I will say their episode they did on NCT's sticker, very interesting. But there isn't a lot of that. And I think that a lot of people who are very passionate about music just they don't have the education and I think that's fine yeah. but it, it is fun when people that do have that background are able to kind of break things down for you mm-hmm. I don't expect everyone to be able to pick out things like over compression maybe you can just describe it as like a vague feeling that this section of the song sounds different or this vocal for whatever reason sounds different from this other one I mean again Dr. Tizard is correct <laughs> that not very many people talk about that stuff maybe it's just down to not a lot of people have the background He didn't really talk about it much either, though. Yeah, he didn't talk about it at all. So (laughs) he said it. That was it. (laughs) And then that was it. Yeah. I mean, he's a musician. So yeah. It just felt like he would touch on something that would be like, yes, you had a good point, but he wouldn't go into it. He would just go back to his main thesis of music nowadays is bad. And it's like, (laughs) you were on to something. Which is why I would love to know what the guidelines for this article were. Like, is that why? Did he have a certain word count that he had to hit? Is that? why it's so short and honestly not really in depth about any of the points that he touched on or did he really feel like this was all he had to say and it was published because it's an opinion piece and it right. doesn't have nearly the high of threshold as you were if it was something like here's the history of iu mm-hmm. and here's how she went from idol to just general musician that people know about which Gian did an article. Yeah, Gian did an article. That's and an opinion we piece. Have a three-part series on the K-pop Sunday podcast about her work, so we should link those as well. And which also makes me wonder: since he has been in Korea for twenty years, does he not see IU as an idol? Because she is one of the few idols that is likely in the news mill constantly. Not only is she acting now, but her music has transcended K-pop fans. So I'm very curious about that as well. Or groups like Winner that are very much idols, but their popularity is very small in the West compared to how big they are in Korea. Yeah, the Winner is one of my favorite groups. And yeah, I visited Seoul right before COVID hit back in fall 2019. But I was just walking through the little subway, like the mall. They're like little shops, like when you go through the subway. But you walk past little stores and stuff and you hear like really, really coming out. And (laughs) (laughs) it's like, go, okay. <laughs> like winner just sort of in the background people listen to winner but yeah in the west they have almost no profile at all so our general consensus is yes you're right that there is an issue of reporting yes there is an issue with what is boosted up to the top when it's not even the artist's best work in our, our opinion mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. there's more to it than what this article went into. So if you just looked at this article and you didn't know as much of a background of K-pop, you might be thinking, wow, that's really the state of things. And you're not going to find things like Steve Reich or Nat Coleman in the mainstream pop charts, and that's right. okay. Because you didn't find them in the mainstream pop <laughs> charts back when they were very active either. <laughs> so 
Well, that's another thing, too, that I didn't think about was certain people who we think of the greats today were not the greats in their time. Yes, exactly. Or my favorite example, which I use all the time because it's the Bay City Rollers. If you don't know who the Bay City Rollers are, you're not alone. They were the most popular band in the world. They sold like millions and millions and millions of records in 1975. People were injured at the concerts from rioting, like fans oh would faint when they they saw them <laughs> you know that you can find the like pictures of girls just like freaking out about the bay city rollers the bay city rollers you know neither wrote nor performed their own material they were really popular in 1975 now nobody knows who they are the velvet underground no one knew who they were now you can buy like the andy warhol banana shirt at uniqlo i mean our memories are the strange thing well and also i think about how the beatles early beatles versus the beatles when they came to the u.s and were wearing suits mm. are two very different <laughs> Oh, times yeah. in the Beatles yeah. time yeah. but how people at the time adults were saying oh this is just garbage it's na -na 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 -na. Mm -hmm. going on and on and on and now because their fans have grown up they're like this is really good they hold it up because it was good for them so I think that also might be a part of it is that you carry the people who like made an impression on you that you thought were the greatest. You carry them as you're an adult, even if like you don't keep up with their music later on and stuff like that. You at least remember them from that time period. Mm -hmm. And when someone brings up something about music, you're like, what about this group? Like the amount of times I bring up SG Wannabe and if you don't know who they are, how big of a deal they were, you're just like, why would Ballad Artists be so big? And it's like, you don't understand the dying days of first gen and the start of second gen. And there's certain things like that. So how people talk about BTS today, who knows later on their fans, like 20 years from now might be sort of ignoring this time period right. of their expansion into the West and the music there. And then they do focus on those earlier works or whatever comes later maybe that would be more impressive to them or blackpink fans who yes they're holding them up now but who later newer fans might be like i don't get why they were such a big deal because that's happened a lot in k-pop where it's like these are the number one they're everywhere it's like jaja -ja. yeah they just get erased i mean when was the last time you heard about bap or beast right you know? i still listen to them <laughs> well i mean yes we do but... right right, right. <laughs> i remember how long people were pushing Yongook's writing and look at how much he's thinking about the world and stuff like that and how people were just nuts over that and now people if they know him they just think of how bad the company was right it's selective retrospection <laughs> Well, also, once again, the people involved who were listening to it at the time, they have probably moved on, mm -hmm. which I know that I was kind of in that category of moving out of K-pop. But then I started hearing about people saying things of, oh, this is new. This never happened. Yada, yada. <laughs> I was like, who are you people? And then just like the outrage of that got me back into it. <laughs> That's exactly what happened to me, too, because I never really used to pay all that much attention to sort of American media coverage of idols. Right. And then once I did, I was like, oh, no, <laughs> oh, no, this is all wrong. We ready to wrap up? I think so. Yeah. So this has been a great discussion. We have been dying to get the idol cast on here for ages. We've been bugging her. <laughs> so we are very glad that you came and had this conversation with us because you know way more about music than we do. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, I love your guys' podcast. I think you have such a respect for getting the details right. And for the history itself, that I think is really admirable. I think you guys do a really great work. Thank you. That's so sweet. <laughs> no, I, I really appreciate all the work you guys do, sort of rescuing these groups. Like the, I think the latest episode in my feed anyway is the Sea Clown. Yes. So, <laughs> my <know>. baby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think it's just such a great addition to the K-pop media world well also your stuff you were the one who sent me the one about hyunjin young being in the la times yeah, yeah. i reference that all the time to people oh, do you really <laughs> yeah the la times yeah it's wild just stuff like that is so good so important to know people were thinking that and doing that back then
In preparing for this discussion today, we looked at two articles besides the Dr. Tizards. We also looked at the Idolcast article and we will be linking both in the description and in the script for this episode. So that way you can check it out, think it about for yourself. And also Dr. Tizard, as mentioned before, he does have a podcast so you can go and listen to him and look at his opinions. We more wanted to stick to what did he present in this article instead of go hunting through, I think he's got like over 30 episodes. That's a lot to go through <laughs> this time yeah he's got about 37 episodes 38 mm-hmm. episodes as of this recording so i was not going to marathon all that <laughs> just to look at his opinion for this one thing that he put out of his own opinion right so but in case that this comes across his desk we did not intend for this to be just bashing kind of thing this is more of a discussion of what we would have liked to see because he touched on a lot of good things but he didn't expand into them we would have liked to seen that right or more depth into that but of course this was an opinion piece which is why i think that he didn't go into all that but that's just me yeah just wanted to put that out there though that this wasn't like go burn down his barn or something like garbage like that don't do that don't bother people right that's not what this is about so we just want to emphasize that because we do not condone any of that Mm -hmm. to my knowledge our audience isn't that way so hopefully we keep it that way and in addition to idolcast articles we will also have some social media and other links for her own personal endeavors the response article was so well thought out so well written highly recommend Oh, thank you. And my most recent episode up, I believe, is the one on the Rise of the Hip Hop mm. Idol featuring Cho PD, if you'd like to learn more about him. Yes, so. plug, plug. Good, good, good. Okay, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, then please make sure to rate, subscribe, follow, and tell your friends about us. If you want to interact with us or just see more of our content, then you can follow us on Twitter at kpop sunbays or on our other social media platforms which will be in the description special thank you to idolcast for coming on and discussing this article with us i also want to say our main podcast is now releasing episodes and more single scoops are coming your way soon so thank you everyone bye 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 thanks so much for having me on Annyeong. <laughs>